Good morning. How is everyone? Yeah, awake, had a coffee now, had a little break and some biscuits. Cool. Um, my name is Paul Maddox. I'm here today to talk about serverless. And we're going we're gonna to dive deep today on some of the best practices around development with serverless. So as a bit of background, my name is Paul Maddox. I'm a solutions architect at AWS. I have quite an interesting job. I work with, well, I might be a bit biased there, but I, I work with companies of all different sizes, right from startups to enterprises, with the goal of helping them do better development on AWS. Um, so my background is before AWS, it was a world of tin and metal in data centers, software development and systems architecture for 15, 16 years. Um, I hold all eight, seven AWS certifications. Who here in the room is certified? Well done, everyone. <laughs> Good job. Um, my background is, has a lot of development in it. So I, these days, mainly work with Go, Java, some C, and some Node as well in there as well. So I want to talk today a bit about um, serverless development in general. How many people have played with serverless? Quite a few. Okay. How many people really feel like they've got the development process locked down? Okay quite a few less people there. Hopefully by the end of today's session, that's going to change. And you're going to feel a lot more comfortable deploying faster in a very safe way on AWS. So we're going to talk through how to build a serverless API, a backend. This is just one of the use cases for um, serverless, but it actually fulfills the purpose of this session quite nicely. We're going to talk through the options around development frameworks. So there's a lot of different serverless frameworks out there. What are some of the pros and cons? How do you tie them together? Which should you use, et cetera? We're going to talk about the AWS serverless application model, AWS SAM, um, and how you can deploy and set up CI, CD, and automation of tests, et cetera, with SAM, and services like AWS Code Build and Code Pipeline. I'm going to show you some tricks for running your serverless projects locally on your machine using Docker. So, running Lambda or an API gateway all locally so you can get a really nice, fast local development experience, including testing and debugging and other stuff, which is an area that I know a lot of serverless people find challenging. So we'll show that and we'll do some demos and we'll build some stuff today. And we're going to talk about another hot topic around serverless, which is security. How best should you secure your serverless apps? If you're building an API, what are your options available for authentication, authorization, for example? Maybe you've heard of Cognito, maybe you're using Cognito. Are you following the best practices? We're going to dive into that a bit today. And then we're going to have Q&A. So when I started in IT, I mentioned I worked in a world of tin and metal. And when I wanted to start a new project or something, the cost, the cost was quite high. Right? In terms of CapEx, we had to go and procure new equipment. Um, we had to right size it. We had to work with our marketing teams, et cetera, to try and work out how much hardware do we need. Now, how much do we buy? What if we get it wrong? Either we're wildly successful and we need to rapidly buy more to keep up, or the project fails and then we've just wasted maybe a couple of years, you know, a load of CapEx investment. And either way, it's quite a painful process. So coming to AWS a couple of years ago, um, when I first started playing with serverless, it really hit home with me. It was a sort of wow moment. You know, all this, this struggle that I've had for the last 15 years of my IT career is, is just gone. Um, so in a serverless world, there are no servers to provision or manage for the customer. Right? So as a developer, you're able to focus on your application and what differentiate, differentiates your business in the market, rather than the undifferentiated heavy lifting, such as you know, data centers, colo, power, heating, et cetera, and all that kind of stuff. In a serverless world, your application should scale with usage. So you shouldn't need to spend hours and weeks and days and loads of meetings trying to work out how much load you're going to have when you first launch. Right? You want to be able to upload your functions to a service that scales automatically on your behalf. And key here is reducing that cost of failure in an organization. If you're paying a lot of CapEx up front, buying hardware, fitting in data centers, et cetera, then the cost for a project failing is quite high. Right? Maybe you can repurpose it. Maybe you've still got time before the hardware refresh. But in a serverless world where you never pay for idle, this is a really powerful thing. And it allows people to experiment. And that's such a key thing in a company to keep a company innovating. In the serverless world, you get things like availability and fault tolerance built in. Now, you can do this on EC2 and other areas of the AWS platform. 
but it requires some planning and thought and know-how and knowledge and you know maybe you'll get it wrong who knows uh, with serverless a lot of this is taken care of for you it also allows a, a new way of thinking about architectures um, so gone are the days of batch processing and more moving towards event-based architectures if you imagine a concrete example whereby a let's say a power company wants you to take a photo of your meter every every six months or whatever to do the reading on your meter in traditional architectures that would normally all get uploaded maybe somewhere FTP SFTP somewhere and then there'd be like a nightly churn and batch process where it churns through like all these thousands of images and OCRs them and maybe the customer's image was too blurry but by then it's 12 hours later or 24 hours later and the customer's given given up right they're not going to go back and do another meter reading and try and get that less blurry picture but with things like serverless you're able to move to event-based architectures so rather than that batch type process you can move to a world where whenever a photo is uploaded a lambda function gets triggered and then you can feed back to the customer faster and keep them engaged longer so it's a really powerful but it, it's it allows you to create new types of architectures so in AWS you can trigger a lambda function off a load of different event sources one of them is a HTTP request coming in uh, it could be something getting uploaded to s3 it could be a row changing in a DynamoDB table and then you can run your logic in lambda and from your lambda function you can you can do whatever you can do in your normal code right you can use AWS SDKs you can contact third parties and you can put your business logic in there so that's kind of the high level slides on serverless a bit of baseline knowledge for everyone for those that haven't played with serverless before apologies for people who have that may have been a bit uh, a bit basic but we're going to dive in now and talk about how to build an api with serverless so if you've been researching serverless or using serverless for a while you'll know that there's quite a few different frameworks available for you to use they solve a rather they solve a, a, a a challenge in the serverless world right whereby you're decomposing your application away from this monolithic type architecture into lots and lots of microservices and maybe even down to the function level with serverless and then you've got all these functions everywhere and you need to tie them all together into an application and maybe put different event sources like HTTP endpoints in front of them etc and then you've got to take that blob of functions and you know, uh, all the, the API definitions and such and deploy them as a single entity. So that's what a lot of these frameworks do. Um, you have, for example, serverless, really common one in the market, um, Sparta, Zapper for Python. There's one that we bought out, Chalice for Python. We're going to show that a bit more in a minute. Um, Cloudy.js is an interesting one. It's, it's predominantly for Node-based applications. If you're writing your functions in Node, it allows you to build your Node apps much like you normally would in an express kind of format, whereby you can mount your API endpoints and say, OK, slash hello, do this. It's a nice, simple, easy way to get started. Um, Chalice is an option I mentioned a minute ago that AWS have bought out. So this is focused around Python developers. And if you've ever used Flask in Python, it's super similar. So it works with annotations, and you annotate your methods to describe the HTTP endpoints that functions should be mounted at. So in this case, we've got a really simple app that's just got a root on slash, and it's just returning hello world. So a very, very quick way to get started, and you can write up all your Lambda functions and map them to HTTP endpoints, and then Chalice is going to take care of the deployment for you, and it's going to create that API gateway and map it all together. If we dive in a bit deeper, um, can, can you see this at the back? I can't, can't make it any bigger, but apologies if you can't. Um, so this is a, a more uh, detailed example of a Chalice app. And you can see here we've got app routes, so mounting different functions at different HTTP RESTful endpoints. Um, it also does things like error handling. So it provides a really nice way for you to feedback errors straight back from your Lambda function through API Gateway. Does things like support different HTTP methods? So if you're building out a RESTful API, you probably want to use, you know, put, patch, post, delete, et cetera. So you can attach them easily to functions. I should have said at the beginning, if anyone has any questions, please put your hand up, interrupt me, and feel free. So in amongst all this, there's also AWS SAM. Has anyone played with SAM? 
Anyone use SAM? A few people? Who's heard of SAM? OK, quite a few more. OK, so SAM is a, a deployment framework for serverless applications. Um, a lot of these frameworks that I mentioned on the previous slide have the ability to deploy. Um, so Chalice, for example, you can run Chalice Deploy, and it's going to deploy your, your code up into AWS. But actually, in a CI CD world, in, in like an enterprise development world, you probably want something that's going to build, you know, a single build at the beginning of your pipeline, and then progress that through different environments, and maybe integrates well with things like AWS Code Pipeline or Jenkins or other tooling that you may use. And this is where SAM comes in. So SAM was built with a lot of learnings that we took from running CloudFormation for a long time and having our CloudFormation service. And actually, it's, it's based heavily on CloudFormation. It uses CloudFormation under the hood. And it allows you to describe your serverless application in a really simplified version of a CloudFormation template. So typically, if you were to use CloudFormation to deploy a serverless app, you'd have all your Lambda functions, and your template would probably be about that high. Um, and it's pretty painful. And SAM is a transform that sits on top of CloudFormation and basically allows you to describe a whole serverless app in a few lines. It's an open source specification. So I'll show you in a bit, but the whole specification is on GitHub. You can go and look at it, the whole API reference, et cetera. We accept you know, comments, issues, pull requests. Um, it's very much a community-driven project there. So a SAM template. This is an example of a SAM template. So in this, in this case, it's YAML. Could be JSON. Uh, most people tend to use YAML because it's a bit more concise. Um, so in this case, we've got a AWS serverless function here. And we're setting some properties. So things like the handler. OK, so the file name's index.js. And we're going to call the method get.html. It's a Node.js 4.3. And what permissions do we want our Lambda function to have? In this case, we're just passing in one of the managed AWS policies that grants access to DynamoDB. But you can actually specify your own custom IAM policies there as well. This next section, the event section, is uh, the bit I find the most interesting. This, this allows you to specify what triggers your Lambda function. In this case, we specified an event called get.html. That's just an arbitrary name there. And it's of type API. We're going to mount our Lambda function on this path, and we want it to respond to any HTTP method. So just through these lines of code, behind the scenes, Sam is going to deploy for you a whole API gateway, connect it up to your Lambda functions, and you can specify lots and lots of Lambda functions in here and have your whole application defined in a Sam template. At the bottom there, we're deploying a DynamoDB table. Just two lines there at the bottom will deploy a table, and that can be available in your Lambda function then. Um, one of the cool things about SAM is actually you can just take any CloudFormation resource and put it in a SAM template. So you can use the simplified version for stuff like functions and Dynamo tables and uh, API Gateway, for example. But actually, any CloudFormation that you may have or find online, you can put in there. So things like maybe you want a Redis cache or something, you know, you can, it's flexible in that way. So ultimately, we're taking a concise template, and the output could be as complicated as you want you know, in terms of your architecture. It's designed to be super flexible. That Chalice framework I showed you a minute ago, the Python framework, actually can create a SAM template for you. So if you use the Chalice framework and create a new project, and then just say package, Chalice package, and give it a directory, in this case, just a directory called out, it's going to create for you a deployment zip so all of your functions, all of your code, any dependencies that you may have, third-party modules, they're all going to be packaged up in that zip. And then you get a SAM template alongside it, ready to deploy into AWS. We also have something called SAM Local. It uh, works really well with SAM. And it allows you to run your whole serverless project locally on your machine. Um, so it works with Docker under the hood. Um, I'll show you a bit more detail in a minute. But it, it essentially spawns your Lambda function on your local machine using Docker and wires it all up. You get things like the log files out straight away. So rather than having to go and check the CloudWatch logs to find out what went wrong in your Lambda function, it actually just shows it straight in the console. It actually mimics or mocks API Gateway as well. So if you've got a whole load of Lambda functions all mounted to HTTP endpoints, this will spin up a local HTTP daemon on your machine as part of SAM Local. 
and it will wire up all your Lambda functions. And when you hit them in the browser, it's going to go and run them locally on your machine using Docker. A really cool way of locally developing. It also supports debugging as well. So you can actually set breakpoints. So for Python, Java, or Node.js, you can set breakpoints in your code, like much like you would in traditional software development. You don't have to do the whole kind of print here, print here, print here, everywhere through your code to try and work out where your problems are in your, in your, uh, in your code. So at this point, I'm going to show you um, a demo of this in use. I'm actually going to show you the easiest way, I think, to start a serverless project today. So we're going to load up the AWS console here. And actually create a serverless project. And we're going to build an API from scratch. And we're going to build a full CI CD pipeline around it. Right? So source repo, pipeline, deployment, production stage, etc. Has anyone used CodeStar? OK, not enough people. CodeStar is a really cool service. Um, we bought it out last year. Um, let me load it up here. How's the size at the back? You see, see that? It's good? OK. So CodeStar allows you to create new software projects on AWS. And it automatically instills all the best practices around CI, CD, et cetera. When you first go into it, you get a screen that says, hey, what's your technology stack? So in this case, I get a load of choices on what type of app am I going to write? So is it an Alexa skill or a web service or something? Um, what programming language do I want to use? And then what's my deployment technology at the bottom there, if you can see it? So Beanstalk, EC2, Lambda. In this case, I'm going to pick a web service written in Node.js and deployed to Lambda. So you can see here, this is going to create me an example Express app. Um, and I give it a project name, My Loft Demo. And then when I click Create Project, this is going to do a few things for me. It's going to create me a source repo, a Git repo in AWS Code Commit. It's going to create me a build environment using code build that's going to build my SAM environment, build my, you know, maybe if I'm using Java or something, I can use that to build and create the bundle. Um, then it's going to set up deployment automatically with AWS SAM and CloudFormation and monitoring. And it's going to wrap it all in a code pipeline for me. So if I just kick this off, this takes about two minutes to create. Um, and you get some prompts on how to integrate with your local tooling. Like if you happen to be using Visual Studio or Eclipse, there's some guides there to help you get it set up. Um, I don't happen to use either of those. Ultimately, what you're going to be interacting with here is a Git repo. You check out your code, you make some changes, you push your code back. The service here on Code Pipeline is going to take your code, build it, and deploy it for you every time you commit. So command line tools, for example, will show you how to get connected to the Git repo. And I'm just going to get ready to check that out when that's created. So. OK. I did time this before. It took about 1 minute 10. OK. Ah, oh, there we go. Cool. So this has created me my Git repo, and I can just Git clone that. Uh, oh. Let me make that a bit bigger for you. OK. So loft demo. Let's have a look what it's created for me. So within my source repo, I've got a template.yaml. This is my SAM template that it's written for me. It's going to be quite a simple one to start off with, but we can iterate on this and build on it. Um, I've got my index.js. That's a, a, a file that is created for me with a Lambda function in it. Let's open this up in an IDE and take a look. So our SAM template that it's created, uh, just hide that. It's pretty simple to start off with. We've got a Lambda function in here called Hello World. It's running with Node.js, and it's been given a default role. So Sam's going to set up a load of permissions for us, and we can go in and modify those if we want our Lambda function to be able to do more in the future. 
Um, it set up a couple of API events for us, um, so a post and a get request. And if we look in the actual Lambda function itself, uh, this isn't the one I wanted to create. Sorry, I think I selected the wrong project in code style then. Um, so the Lambda function, index.js, looks like this when you first open it. Uh, remove some of that. OK, that's what it looks like when you first check out your new project. So what it's doing here is it's opening up a file from the file system, the index.html. And it's just playing it back out. It's giving it a HTTP status code. And for the body, it's just going to put the file contents. So in terms of normal development, I could go and make changes to this, commit it back into version control. And CodeStar is going to go and deploy it for me. I'm going to show you my local development stuff that I was talking about, the SAM local stuff here. So in GitHub, we've got SAM local. You just search Google for SAM local, or the repos there. Um, this, this is the SAM local binary tool. It's a CLI-based tool. The only dependency you need before you install it is Docker. So you install Docker on your local machine. You don't need any containers or anything. You don't need to pull any special images. SAM local is going to do that for you. And you can install this CLI tool just with npm install minus g for global AWS SAM local on your machine. So really simple installation, Windows, Linux, Mac. And what this allows me to do, if I go back to my IDE and just open up a terminal here, I can run SAM local start API. So this is going to go away. It's going to fetch that Docker container for me the first time um, for the Node.js runtime. And then it's going to mount my Lambda functions, as described in my SAM template, on a local HTTP server. So I can now go and click on this link, open it up in a browser, and we've got our first serverless application here. Right, all running on my local machine. And actually, if I wanted to maybe add some logging in here, so console.log here. Okay. And then just hit that back in the browser again. I can see back in my terminal here, actually, the logs of the Lambda runtime. So I can see my debug log there where I said here. And I can see things like how much memory it used and how long it took to execute. So really, really nice for that quick local development iterative cycle. Um, let me show you something else you can do as well. So I mentioned debugging and how to actually put breakpoints in your code and do local debugging. If I go back to the SAM local page, there's a section in here that shows exactly how to set up debugging. Right, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much here. But in my idea, in Visual Studio Code, there's a small section you can copy and put it in as a launch configuration. And it's just going to attach to a local debugger. So if I go into the debugger here and hit play, hit play, I've already pasted that in there. So what I need to do is actually start SAM local with a debug flag to tell it what port to listen on. So there's dash dash debug port, and you specify a debug port, and then it's going to start listening. Uh, Connection review. Okay. So if I run that, it's going to run exactly the same command. It's going to mount all my HTTP functions, and, but this time with a debugger. So when I first hit my Lambda function in the browser, it's going to stop execution of my Lambda function. Right? Within that Docker container, it's going to halt the execution. And then I can go and attach my debugger and walk through the code and step through and place breakpoints, for example. So I've got my function there running. I hit it in the browser and just hit refresh. And you'll see this just stays loading indefinitely, right? That's because the execution of my Lambda function has been halted. So if I was to go back in now and say, attach to SAM local, OK, I've now got a breakpoint that's hit. Close my terminal, make it a bit easier to see. So my function ran there. I didn't put a breakpoint in. Let's put a breakpoint here. And let's just hit that again and reattach my debugger. OK. So now I've got my breakpoint. And this breakpoint's just been hit. And in, within my IDE, I can actually go and diagnose this problem and you know, hover over and see what contents is, for example. OK, I can see that's some big 
you know, arbitrary array of binary data in this case because it's just read from a file. But this is really cool. This allows you to debug and diagnose your issues within your Lambda function just as you would in a traditional development environment. Um, what's interesting here is um, this isn't just with this IDE I'm using. This uses standard Node.js debugging or Python or Java debugging processes. So any tooling that you might have to do debugging today with those should work straight away with this. I'll just show you the other bit of code style, what it's created for me hopefully now. Um, so CodeStar, when, when I created my project, it created a code pipeline for me. And you can see this on the right-hand side here. It's automatically been set up so that whenever a source commit happens, it's going to go and build my project, and it's going to deploy it automatically. And you can go and check on status and progress in here and dive a bit deeper. It's going to set things up like automatic monitoring. So with serverless, you get a load of monitoring baked in in CloudWatch. This creates a nice little dashboard for you. You can also really easily add team members. Um, into this so it really quickly gets them up and started. So this is CodeStar. Um, highly recommend you have a play with it. It's a really easy way of starting a serverless project. So let's have a look at what we just deployed. Um, so our, our SAM template had a Lambda function, it had API gateway in front of it, and it could potentially be talking to other AWS services like Dynamo or you know, any, any other AWS services or third-party services from the Lambda code. Just to really quickly go through some of the benefits of these different key components here, API Gateway is a really, really nice way of fronting something. And that something could be a Lambda function. It could be an existing monolithic application maybe that you have with an API tier. It's really good for you breaking out the monolith. If you've got this big monolithic application and you just want to split out, say, slash products to a new microservice, really easily done with API Gateway. It includes things like DDoS mitigation and protection automatically. Right? So under the hood, it's using CloudFront. You get all the DDoS mitigation benefits of CloudFront in front of your API automatically. You can do things like authentication and authorization. I'm not going to cover those here because we've got some slides on that coming up. It also allows you to really easily set up throttles, metering, logging, metrics, graphing on your API endpoints. So you can really easily set up a monetization model for your API if you want, where you create usage plans for your consumers. Like if they, you know, maybe one person gets a gold membership to your API and they can do 100 requests a second or a million a month or whatever. Lambda, you saw us using Lambda a minute ago, but upload your functions, we run them at scale for you. Um, supports a couple of languages. You've got um, Node.js, Java, Python, C Sharp. You can also bring your own libraries. So it works pretty transparently with SAM as well, but if you're using uh, third-party libraries in Node.js or Python, for example, then you can bring those in and install them just as you normally would with NPM or you know, PIP or whatever you use, and SAM's going to bundle them up and deploy them for you. So just because you're using Lambda, it doesn't mean you, you have to give up all your dependencies, et cetera, and libraries. Lambda supports either synchronous or asynchronous invocation. So synchronous would be, for example, an API call, a HTTP request coming in, waiting for a response from the Lambda function, and coming back out again. That's synchronous flow. But it also supports asynchronous models, things like uploading to an S3 bucket, triggers a Lambda function that could do something in an asynchronous manner. Up here, um, you have a very simple resource model with AWS Lambda. Um, so when you're configuring your Lambda function, there's, there's a setting for power, basically. We call it memory. Um, and you can choose between 128 to 1.5 gig. Actually, a really good tip here is behind the scenes, this also controls how much CPU and network your function is going to get as well. So if you know your function is going to be quite network heavy or quite memory he or quite CPU heavy, Give it more memory, it will, get more, it will get more of all of those proportionally. Um, in terms of authoring functions, um, you get a WYSIWYG editor within the Lambda console. A lot of you probably started with that in your first experimentations with, with Lambda. But it also supports all this third-party tooling and the stuff I've shown you. Um, hopefully, it should be a really uh, uh, normal programming model for you. So you're free to use processes and threads as you normally would in your code. Um, actually, you get access to slash temp as well on the machine. So behind the scenes, this is just the Linux uh, machine behind the scenes. So if you want to bring your own compiled binaries, for example, like C++ binaries or something that you want to execute from within your Lambda function, 
you can do that as well. Just upload them in your package, right? And then call them out, shell out to them from your Lambda function. And you'll find that if it's been built for Amazon Linux, it will be able to run within Lambda as well. So really cool tip there. You get in all the monitoring and logging with CloudWatch and CloudWatch logs built in, like centralized logging. Um, ultimately, you should be designing your Lambda functions to be stateless. Lambda functions carry no guarantees about where they're going to run, which, which machine, et cetera, they're going to run on. They should be completely stateless. Use things like Redis or DynamoDB or something if you need persistent store, or S3, for example. But don't, don't use the local file system for persistent storage, uh, basically, or, or memory there. So we talked quite a bit about deploying Lambda. Um, and actually setting up and CICD, et cetera, and development frameworks. One thing I wanted to cover as well is something that comes up quite often when we talk about Lambda development, and specifically with APIs, is how do I secure my API? We have, we have a saying at AWS that security is job zero, right? It's, it's right up there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk you through some of the best practices for security when it comes to serverless APIs. If we look back at our graph that we had a minute ago, um, we had our mobile web app, we had internet, API gateway. There's a lot of different places in this that you can secure the flow of traffic. So on the left-hand side, between the client and to the internet. Right? You, you've got HTTPS, TLS from your client, so you can have encryption in transit. And that gap there between the internet and API gateway, there you can put in place really flexible authentication, authorization, rate limiting, throttling, DDoS mitigation, et cetera, with API Gateway. These are some of the features of the API Gateway product. Between API Gateway and Lambda, uh, there's a policy that says, hey, for my Lambda function, this API Gateway is allowed to talk to it and invoke it. And normally, this policy is set up automatically for you. Like, Sam's going to set this up automatically. But just know that it exists, right? You may want to go in there and tweak that at some point in the future. Between your Lambda function and other AWS services, you've got IAM. So when you create a Lambda function, you can assign it an IAM role. And that way, you can give it really fine-grained permissions to say, hey, my Lambda function, I want it to be able to access S3, but only these buckets. And only, only put items, not get, for example. Maybe I want DynamoDB, but only on this row in the table. You can be really granular at that point as well. Right? Don't just leave that as a wide open admin policy and your Lambda function can do anything. Uh, I've seen it. Don't do it. <laughs> yes? Uh, quick question. Hmm. My understanding that just between the internet and API gateway, there is an embedded cloud front. Yes. You technically hit the cloud front. Yes. But what happens between cloud front and API gateway? <coughs> Is it plain text or what no, no, no. It's not, it's not plain text. So we, when you configure a, a trigger, basically, on API Gateway, so it's from the internet to API Gateway, do you mean? <laughs> from, from CloudFront. So, yeah, so CloudFront would... CloudFront, the SSL uploads yeah. there. Yep. So that's, that's managed for you, right, with that integration. You, that's, that's taken care of on the AWS bit of the shared responsibility model. Okay. Cool. So some of the mechanisms for adding authentication authorization uh, to your API. So IAM permissions we mentioned, using IAM policies and permissions to grant access. You also have things like custom authorizers and user pools, which you can use together to create a really, really good authentication story for your APIs. So if you haven't seen Cognito user pools before, this is a managed identity provider. Right, so back when I, I run a few startups in my life, and normally one of the first development tasks was create that table in the database where the users are going to live, right? And uh, look up on you know, Hacker News how best to secure passwords in the, whatever year it is now, right? This is a lot of risk for a startup to take on or any company to take on. Cognito User Pools is a managed offering, managed by AWS in this space, to basically store and authenticate and identify all of your users. So, it's very low cost. It has a free tier of 50,000 monthly active users. So your identity pool could have you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of users in it. But actually, it's billed based on monthly active users. And if your monthly active users is less than 50,000, it's completely free. It's within the free tier. Uh, and then the billing grows from them. So it's a really easy way to get them started with a user directory and identity provider in the AWS platform. And it's got some really cool security features built in as well. 
So one of the things it can do is host your UI for you for sign up and sign in. Some companies may want that when you first get started, provides a really easy integration experience, just use our UI, you can customize it a bit. Uh, sometimes you may want to use your own UI, so you can do that too. It's got an API, you can interact with it via the API. <laughs> Ultimately, it's going to be storing the user profile data, but it's going to do some quite cool things around things like forgotten passwords. Right, so you shouldn't have to code the forgotten password routine. Cognito user pools will do that for you. When a user hits that link for forgotten passwords, we're going to send them an email and we're going to send them a code and generate that code and help them take them through the process of clicking the code and setting a new password and all that kind of stuff. Um, similar for multi-factor authentication. One of the options you can just turn on with a toggle on your user pool is multi-factor authentication. When you turn this on, it can be either on, optional, or off. And this will allow your users to, if it's set to optional, turn on MFA. What does that mean? When they log in from a brand new device, then we're going to send them a text message with a code, a one-time password. And then in your UI or our UI for login, there'll be a text box that says enter that code. So this kind of MFA, multi-factor authentication dance, we're going to take care of that for you. We're going to send that text message. We're going to validate it for you. The end result is a set of tokens, right? So. Uh, Cognito user pools as an identity provider generates tokens, OpenID Connect tokens, with all of the user's attributes like first name, surname, etc. in there. And then you can use those to authenticate your APIs. And I'll show you in a bit more detail how we set up and do that. So within API Gateway, within the console here, I'm showing the console just because it's visual, but you can do it via CLIs, SDKs, CloudFormation, etc. So you have an option on your API to create an authorizer. This will decide who's allowed into your API and what they can access. So a really easy option here is just to select the Cognito user pool authorizer and then just specify your user pool. So just pick it from a drop down. What this is going to do is make sure that only people who pass in a token in that authorization header, in this case, only people that pass in a token that's been issued by that particular Cognito user pool will be able to access your API. Everyone else is going to get a 403, not allowed in, nah, nah, go away. So this is a really easy way to you know, put that front door in front of your API. But there is a bit of a limitation here. It supports authentication, like this person is a user from my user pool. But it doesn't allow you to do authorization. You can't say, OK, this user can access these bits of the API, but maybe this user is an admin user, and they can access a bit more of the API. So there's kind of a trade-off here between really simple to set up, but a bit limited in terms of authorization. If you need more flexible uh, authorization, there's something called a custom authorizer in API Gateway. And this sits, if you look back to our original diagram here, this sits here. And this, this is API Gateway. When a request comes in, it will fire off a request to the custom authorizer function. The custom authorizer takes an input, right? It takes the HTTP request and details around it. Things like that header, the authorization header where you might have a token, or maybe some other headers that you use today for your own authentication. And this Lambda function, its job, the logic it needs to do is to decide, is this person who they say they are, right? So with Cognito user pools, it can go away to Cognito user pools and validate that the token's valid or something. If you're using it for your own uh, authentication systems, you know, maybe connecting it to your own existing IDPs or backends, then you need to make sure it can authenticate the person and know who they are. The response from this Lambda function needs to be a policy. It looks a lot like an IAM policy that says, OK, this user can access these specific API endpoints. So maybe they can access a get request on their user profile, but deny them access to an admin page or something, just as an example here. So because this Lambda function, the custom authorizer, is something that you write. Yes? Is it possible for the authorizer to get blocked? Good question. Good question. Uh, so the question for those on Twitch and those that didn't hear it, uh, is it possible for that custom authorizer function to get throttled? Yes. Yes, it is. And you don't want to put a Lambda function that you know, may have a cold start or something or may get throttled in the critical path of every single API call. So Cognito doesn't do that. API Gateway doesn't do that. What it will do is for the particular request coming into the function. So imagine you've got a token in the HTTP header, the authorization header, and it's got a token in it. It will cache the response of that custom authorizer function 
for that token. So that's why it's important to say uh, everything that user is allowed to access in the response policy that's generated by the custom authorizer function. So that is cache. By default, it's five minutes. Uh, but you can tweak that cache value as well. Yes? Uh, when that custom authorizer bundle is invoked, are you charged for that, or is part of the API? So the question is, are you charged for the custom authorizer? Yes, you are. Yeah. This is just a, a standard Lambda function in your account. You create it in the same way you create any other Lambda function. It's just that you tell API Gateway, use this function for my authorizer. If you go into the Lambda console, uh, you know, when you see all the Lambda blueprints, all the potential functions that are being pre-written, there's a custom authorizer in there. So you can go and look at an example and see what the code looks like. So tying back to Chalice, I showed you Chalice earlier and how we could build an API with Chalice. It turns out integrating this uh, user pool authentication authorization into your application is really easy with Chalice. So in Chalice, I can initiate a new authorizer object and create a new Cognito user pool authorizer that we've imported here. I provided the details of my Cognito user pool, just the yarn of it. And then from then on, I can do things like authorizer equals that authorizer up there. And I can pick and choose which of my API methods I want to front with that authorizer. So I can be selective here. And just with a couple of lines of code, stick that full authentication authorization in front of my API. So that's the end of, of my talk. Hopefully, from this talk, you have a, a good idea of the best practices around building uh, and developing and testing Lambda and serverless projects, using things like SAM, CodeStar to generate your code pipeline for you. SAM, you can actually integrate with your own tooling, right, if you don't want to use any of that. You can integrate it with Jenkins, et cetera, or whatever you're using, as long as it supports initiating CLI commands. Um, so we talked about how serverless, you know, you have no management of servers. You're only paying for what you're using with the power to instantly scale up. Right? I've shown you the tooling that you can use to actually create your first serverless project within minutes um, and get all that sort of baked in security and high availability. There's a couple of useful resources I wanted to call out here. Um, the first is our serverless portal. So on the AWS website, we have a whole section dedicated. It was created quite recently, dedicated towards serverless development resources, right? helping you get started, a load of different tutorials, reference architectures, partners that you can get in contact with to help with your projects if you want. Um, and we also have a section as well that's dedicated to uh, more the developer tooling side of it, so CICD and SAM and those frameworks. So the slides are going to be shared anyway afterwards, but you're free to take a picture. Um, one thing I, I don't think I saw the slide come up on this. I wonder if it, this. Did I skip past this slide? I shouldn't have. This is really cool. Uh, there's $50 in AWS credits available. If you use CodeStar, spin up that exact same example that I just did, right? And click the tweet link. Is that, that icon there? That's going to create a tweet for you that says, I've just created my first serverless application. And then just pop that in a form, and you get $50 free AWS credits just for playing around and experimenting, because, hey, experimentation is good, right? OK, that's everything from me. Is there any Q&A? Uh, it looks like there, there may be some on Twitch. But before I do that, is there any Q&A in the room? Uh, I'm going to go back there, because I saw you first. No. So in front of your API, one, one of the, uh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to. So the question was, is it possible to front your API with IAM authentication and a custom authorizer? So those are two options that you have available to you. Unfortunately, it's not. But I'm happy to take that back as a feature request to the team. Yes, sir. Um, so the question was, any tips on how to isolate and run serverless projects in multiple different environments, prod, UAT, staging, et cetera? Um, this is where SAM becomes really powerful. Because SAM is just cloud formation, you're able to just inject it into different AWS accounts and run and deploy that same SAM package into multiple accounts if you're separating by accounts. Um, or you, know, you can deploy it multiple times into the same AWS account and just give it a different stack name in CloudFormation. 
So it, it had built-in ability to isolate via cloud formation, basically. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yep. Yep. So the question was, does SAM tie me to a single repo? Am I able to, at a later date, split out my service, my Lambda function, my SAM project into multiple repos? Absolutely. Right? You can just take your functions out of that template and move them to another template really easily. And they can be across multiple repos there. You would just deploy them as two different cloud formation stacks. Uh, that's a good question. I haven't had that before. Um, so the question was, when I deploy a SAM template, SAM is a transform on CloudFormation. It's a simplified way of describing CloudFormation. When I've deployed one, if I look in the CloudFormation console, you see the big template that it's been expanded out to, the full CloudFormation template. Is there a way of getting back the old template? I mean, you should have it in version control, right? <laughs> that should be the artifact that you're working with every day. Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to check on that. Come find me afterwards and we'll, we'll have a play and see what we can do. Then the link is not working. The link is not working. OK. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do much about that. If you are interested, come find me and I'll try and help everyone afterwards. Let's do some on this side of the room because we've been mainly focused on that side so far. So the question, I missed the beginning of the question, was it with SAM, how do you deal with In CodeStar. So CodeStar, you can take that pipeline that gets created, the one that was on the right-hand side. By default, when you deploy a CodeStar project, it's just going to create um, a prod environment, just one environment for you, basically. But you can extend that code pipeline. You can actually have it deploy multiple environments as well there. So just go into the AWS code pipeline console, find the pipeline it's created, and actually just add a new stage in there, new environment in there. Can we do that with SAM? Um, so normally, you would, the SAM artifact that you create, your SAM package that you build, is a single artifact that you would deploy to multiple environments. So the environment handling isn't baked into SAM. It's actually deliberately separate. So the pipeline is what defines multiple environments and allows you to deploy to multiple environments. So we cannot have version control on that? So like yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, pipe, the code pipeline, you can actually export or import as a template, a JSON template. So your whole CI CD pipeline, you can stick it in version control, and we'd recommend that. Right? So you get some versioning around that. Oh, OK. Well, at least that means I won't have a deluge of people coming up to me afterwards. Where's my $50? <laughs> yes, at the back. Server to server, yes. there are no servers. Uh, you've got to <laughs> yeah. yeah, so two microservices, and how do you get them to talk to each other? This is where the IAM authentication really comes into play. So I show custom authorizers here, but actually the other option on API Gateway is IAM authentication. And this is really powerful for microservice to microservice communication because you can use an IAM policy on one, on one Lambda function, and that IAM policy can describe what it can access. So that's a good use case for using um, IAM authentication on an API. I'm going to do one more and then answer a few on Twitch. Uh, so you can, it does both. It does both. So you can say who can access. So this Lambda function, in that case, you can go microservice to microservice. So you can say this Lambda function can access it, but it can only access these bits. And that's the authorization bit. So using the policy, the IAM policy, you can describe what it can access. Uh, so we have a question here. Is it possible to integrate API Gateway, Cognito, IAM roles to provide authorization for your application? Can you use IAM roles to find permission levels in your application? Uh, so I think we kind of covered this. You either do a custom authorizer or you do IAM authentication on your API. Uh, and I think that's it. Do we have any others on Twitch? That's it. Okay. 
I'm going to be around for a couple of hours, probably. Just come find me if you have other questions. More than happy to talk through your projects. Thank you very much.